All right. All right. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the uh, Fedora Leads and Linux Distribution Development Track um, here at Flock. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Adam Williamson, who will be doing a presentation today, Fedora CI and Automated Testing. I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, so yeah, I'm Adam Williamson. I am the Fedora QA team lead for Red Hat. Uh, I've been doing this for, for quite a long time. I started in 2009. Uh, as you can see from the next slide in my deck, which is a picture Mo Duffy took in 2010 in Zurich. So there I am, all you know, young and optimistic with Peter Robinson and I think Jesse Keating. So yeah, I've been doing this for a while. Um, just so you guys know, my policy for talks is to hold Q&A and feedback to the end, otherwise it's hard to get through on time, so I'll definitely make sure to leave space for questions, but just hold them to the end. Uh, so yeah, let's get into it. Uh, is that the next slide? I guess that's the next slide. So how do we test Fedora? Um, this is kind of some background. This is all going to come up later on, so I just want to establish it. There's different levels you can test at. There's diskit, which is where we keep the sources for the packages. So you can actually, you know, run tests before a build, an official build has ever happened. You can run tests on pull requests. You can, you know, run nightly tests on the Git repo if you like. Uh, you can test after an official build happens in Koji or an unofficial build, you know, any kind of build in Koji. That's another place you can test. You can test updates, which are, you know, when we put related builds together into an update and say, this is the thing that needs to go into the distribution, you can test at that level. Um, and you can test composes, and composes are when we put all the builds together and we make images out of them, we make repositories out of them, we do that nightly for most streams of Fedora. You can run tests after composes happen. So these are, these are kind of the, the main levels that you can run testing at. So, some background to, I mean, the, the topic of the talk is where we are with automated testing, but, you know, how we got there in the first place is kind of useful to the story. So, in ye olde days, um, this is what we did. We basically, in a QA consents context, we didn't do any testing of package sources. Like, maintainers might do it for themselves, but that was outside of the scope of QA. Um, build testing at the build level, again, we really only had uh, what maintainers did themselves in the, the check section of the package where a, you know, a package build can run test scripts and fail if they don't work. Um, at the update level, we had manual testing. So this is all, you know, circa, say, 2013 or something. There was manual testing of updates, which was, you know, kind of haphazard. We have this little mechanism where if a wiki pay, a test in the wiki is specially tagged, it will show up on the update page. So we can kind of give you some guidance. This is a test it might be useful to run on this update. But that was about it. Other than that, people would test the update and say, yeah, it's good. What did they actually test about it? We don't know. They just said, yeah, it's good, or they didn't. If they said it was bad, they would normally tell us why, which is useful. But yeah, it's very haphazard. There's no way of knowing that what you're testing from update to update is the same. And sometimes an update just wouldn't get any testing. So do we know if it works? No, we don't. We have no idea. Um, and it's very difficult manually to check if an update breaks initial install of the system or the compose process. And we'll get to that later. This is an advantage. But that was a thing that was very difficult to do with manual testing. Um, for composed testing, that was probably where we used to focus our manual testing the most. Um, so we would put a lot of work into manually doing what we called release validation testing, which was, you know, it's focused on, okay, we have a release candidate, is this release candidate ready to go? And we would run, you know, over 100 manual tests to decide if that was the case. Um, and that gave us pretty decent coverage. You know, we didn't ship many completely broken releases, but it's, it's very time intensive. It's very boring because you just sit there spinning up virtual machines all day. Camille remembers these days when we would just spend weeks just spin up a virtual machine, run and install this way. Does it work? Okay, do it again. Do it very slightly differently. Do this until you're tired of life. Yeah, so that was, that was an issue. And even the amount of resources we put into it, we couldn't test every Compose. There's a Compose every day. We would go insane trying to do that. So that was another limitation. Um, the consequence of only being able to test periodically is that um, it, you get problems where there's a bug, and then by the time you've noticed the bug, 
there's another bug. So you have these kind of stacks of bugs. By the time you get to testing a Compose, there's these four or five different bugs in it, all of which you could have caught one at a time if you could test every Compose. Um, and it's, if you don't test, one of the nice things about testing very frequently is that it's easier to identify what broke something. So if you don't test very frequently, you're looking, say we ran a test on a Compose and then we do another test two weeks later and we see a problem. We know that something that changed in the last two weeks caused the problem, which is better than nothing, but you know, that's a lot of things to check. So th there's a lot of issues with only doing manual testing. Just some quick sort of history of how we used to do, you know, how we did validation testing and where we got to before we started automating. On the left here, it's, I had to shrink these down a bit, but this is the earliest organized QA testing of Fedora that I could identify is from Fedora uh, Core 5 in God knows when that was, 2001 or something, I don't know. There were 26 tests which I counted out of this table. So then by the time we got to, oh, 2006, I have the note here. Um, by the time we got to Fedora 21 in 2014, which was the release before we started automating things, basically, we had 138 tests. That's not all of them. That's just some of them um, that had to be done manually for every Compose, which was, that was a lot of work. So we'd, you know, gone up six times, and that still wasn't testing everything, and it, it was taking up a lot of our resources. So that was the point at which we were like, okay, we need to change something or we're all gonna go insane. So that's kind of where we got up to. And just as a side note, um, after we started automating things, we've continued to grow the test set. So as of 2023, uh, the Fedora 39 matrices have 202 tests on them, as I count it. This is, I've done this talk three times before for anyone who doesn't know. I have a bit longer today and I'm, so I, I can be a bit goofier. And this morning I found a talk that Will Woods did um, at FUDCON Toronto in 2009. And if I'd had a little more time, I was going to rewrite this entire talk to do it off Will's slide deck, which would be great, but I didn't have the time. Um, so instead I've kind of dumped a few of his slides into my talk just for fun. Um, I don't know the license on these slides, unfortunately. I asked Will, but he hasn't got back to me yet. I'll update that later. So this is from 2009, from Will's slide deck, when he was, this is when they were starting auto QA, which was the automated testing thing at the time. And the fun part is a lot of this stuff is relevant. This is the stuff that, you know, 14 years later, we have finally managed to fix. So um, <laughs> they were discussing, okay, what makes Rawhide broken or good? Can we write code to check that? How can we run that code automatically? All of these are the things we have finally managed to get around to solving with automation recently. So this is all the stuff that we've actually managed to implement. It took a while, but we got there. <laughs> um, so what do we have now? Where did we get to? What are the automated test systems in Fedora? What are they testing? That's, this is the main meat of where we're getting to. The two main automated test systems are Fedora CI and OpenQA. Um, the point I want to get across here is why do we have two? What are they both doing? How do they complement each other? Um, so this has evolved over some time. OpenQA is was effectively came out of that problem of having to do a lot of manual testing, but still not being anywhere near the amount of testing we wanted to get done. Um, at that point in history, the thing, AutoQA had evolved into something called Taskatron, and we were working on that, but it wasn't at the point of being able to automate all of those tests for us. And we wanted to do something, so we picked up this tool called OpenQA that the SUS folks wrote um, and said, look, this can, we can use this right now to help us. We're just going to pick this up and use it. That was a, basically a Skunk Works project which ran on someone's computer under a desk. It ran on SUSE at first. So that's where OpenQA came out of, and we've just kind of gradually built it up since there. Fedora CI is a more kind of planned effort that had more resources behind it. It had some involvement from, you know, the RHEL side of things. It was kind of an idea to standardize and share how automated testing could work across Fedora, CentOS, RHEL, and make it so that Red Hat can push some of its testing that it was doing internally upstream. So try and provide a kind of shared environment so we can get some of those tests running outside of the Red Hat firewall. Um, and it's, 
Fedora CI is kind of trying to offer tools and workflows to packages in a form that will be kind of familiar to people who are used to working with CI systems upstream, whereas OpenQA is very different from that. Um, so that's kind of the, back, the background where we have here. So the way it's worked out is that CI is kind of intended to be self-service. If you're a Fedora packager, it's like it's a way you can write tests for your thing and get them run at a time in a way that makes sense to you. You can have the tests run on pull requests, you can have the tests run on package builds, the results can come back to you in Diskit or in Bodhi. It's not, there's nobody centrally writing the Fedora CI tests in general. That's not how Fedora CI works. So it's kind of, a, it's a developer workflow is the idea. As I say there, think about providing CI services to people working in Fedora. OpenQA is more, it's testing of Fedora itself. It's not something for Fedora people to use to test their little bit of Fedora that they're working on. It's about making sure Fedora, the thing we define as Fedora is working well. Um, with Fedora CI, the system is, is the thing. The people who work on CI wake up every day and think about how they can make the system better. With OpenQA, the system isn't the interesting thing. I'm the, me and Lucas are the main people working on OpenQA. We kind of wake up and say, are any of the tests failing? How can we fix that? Can we write some interesting new tests? We don't think about improving the test system. So that's kind of the difference there. So to get into some more detail on both the test systems, what is OpenQA? Uh, OpenQA is a system for testing which it's, it's kind of designed to test the way a human tests. So OpenQA spins up a virtual machine and then it knows how to type, it knows how to see things on the screen, it knows how to click on them. And all of this is happening basically at the level of the virtual machine. It has no idea what operating system it's testing. You can use it to test a firmware interface. You can test Windows. You can, it doesn't hook into any kind of toolkits or anything like that. It's just looking at the screen and clicking on things and typing things. Um, and then, yeah, it's, the way it originally works, it's all about looking at the screen, matching screenshots. Um, it's been developed these days so that it does have some integration for Linux consoles specifically. So you can run commands at a console, you can get the output from them, you can get the exit code from them in a kind of programmatic way. So you can write tests that are like, okay, run this command, did it pass or fail? That can be a requirement, so it has that capability. Um, what we use it for, as I said on the previous slide, we use it for high level functional testing. It's like we define, we kind of build off the release criteria and things like that and we say, okay, what are the core requirements for Fedora? What are the things we want to know at all times? Are these still working? That's what OpenQA focuses on testing. So we run um, a set of tests on all Fedora composers, also Fedora Core OS composers, IoT composers, cloud composers, there's probably some other kind of compose, I'm forgetting. Any kind of Fedora compose, we run some tests on it. Uh, ELN we're testing now, which is a fairly new thing. Um, it runs a slightly smaller subset of tests on every critical path update for Fedora. Every single critical path update, nearly, will have at least some of the OpenQA tests run on it. Um, which is pretty big across all releases, not just stable, but also branched in raw height. So that's, it's running a lot of tests. I'll get to some numbers in a bit, but that's a lot of testing. Um, so OpenQA is great. The screenshot driven testing is really useful. Um, as I said, what we've started out wanting to do with OpenQA is test the installer, like automate our installation testing. And it's fantastic for that because almost nothing else can do that, but OpenQA is really good at it. So that was kind of the entry point. But it is also useful, we use it for you know, testing things like um, des desktop applications, Lucas has been working on a lot lately. Um, and it also, it, we managed to implement like client server testing with it, which is really useful. So we're using it to test things like free IPA, database servers, just because we have a good architecture for having multiple test machines sort of interact with each other. So it's also good for that. Um, yeah. Do, 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 do. Just to go off briefly how OpenQA looks, because I wanted to have a sort of more practical element to this. Um, you're not necessarily expected to look at this. It's more kind of something for me to be looking at most of the time, or Lucas to be looking at. We see OpenQA as kind of a service that QA provides, but if you are interested, this is kind of how it works. This is what it looks like. On the left is sort of the overview for a given thing we're testing, in this case a Compose. 
Um, so if you clicked on one of those little dots, the green or orange or red dots, you will get to the interface on the right, which is the details about that specific test. And you can see kind of it's got thumbnails all the time it's running, and green ones mean the thing that was meant to happen there happened, either a screenshot match or a command succeeded. Uh, gray ones are kind of informational or it was waiting for something, and red one means something failed. So here we've got a real failed test. We click on the red thumbnail and we can see you know, it's booted, but it's at the emergency mode, which is not where it should be. So we can, we can see what went wrong, and then you can get logs out and start investigating the failure. Uh, okay, yeah, otherwise I'm gonna mess up my timings. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how OpenQA looks from, you know, my end of it. So here's some details on what we're actually testing in OpenQA today, because I, f I wanted to give this talk because we've been developing this stuff for a long time now, and I'm not sure people kind of understand the extent to which it's grown and what it's covering, because we really are testing a lot of stuff now. Uh, so for Composes, we're covering 75% of the validation test suite, which are those, those tables I showed earlier, the 130 tests as of you know, Fedora 21 or 200 something tests now. 75% of those are automated. We do not need to run them manually, which is fantastic, makes life so much easier. Um, we also do run some additional tests that aren't technically release blocking, but are useful. So for instance, we test Silverblue because it seems important. It's good to know whether it's working. Um, in more detail, you know, what it's actually testing, it runs a lot of install tests in different, you know, configurations. It tests the different images, it tests installing different package sets, uh, it tests a lot of partitioning stuff, you know, can you install the XT4, can you install XFS, can you install ButterFS, can you do thin partitioning, can you resize existing partitions, all of this stuff that was incredibly annoying to do manually, it does all of that. It installs in different languages. Since the last time I gave this talk, Lucas has implemented a Turkish install test, which is great. So we test um, French, Turkish, uh, Japanese, Russian, I think one other, and they're all kind of languages that are interesting for various reasons to do with character set rendering right to left. And Turkish is interesting because it has weird case rules. So this lets us cover you know, oddities that tend to pop up with different languages. Um, it tests UEFI and BIOS, so it, it just covers a whole combinatorial mess that we don't have to test manually anymore. Um, but we go a long way beyond install testing these days. So what we call the base tests test sort of really core functionality, like can you install a package? Can you remove the package? Can you update the system? Can you log in? Can you log out? Can you reboot? Um, is SE Linux in enforcing state like it should be? Uh, can you manipulate services, which again is incredibly boring to test manually, but it, it enables the service, disables the service, starts the service, stops the service, reboots about five times, and yeah, you don't have to do that by hand anymore, which is great. Does logging work? Uh, we also test upgrades, which again is huge because that was a massive time sink to do manually. So we test whether, you pre starting with a clean install of each supported package set for the previous release and the release before that, can you upgrade to the current release? And then we also test, does stuff work after you do the upgrade? So we know, for instance, that you can upgrade a free IPA server and it will keep working as a free IPA server, which is super valuable. Um, we do quite a lot of graphical desktop testing. Um, you know, we test the desktop itself. We test things like, are notifications working? Um, can you, you know, log in, log out? We test from within the desktop. We test whether every single pre-installed application starts up and quits successfully, at least. Um, and we do some detailed testing of quite a lot of apps now, which Lucas has been working on. Uh, so there's really quite a lot of testing whether the desktop works. Printing we test, like updating from within the desktop. Um, and we test all of these, as I said, we test them not just from a fresh install, but we do an upgrade and then we test them again. So that's pretty useful coverage. And we test on Silverblue as well. Uh, we have some pretty advanced tests for server functionality. Uh, so as I said, we test free IPA. Very recently, this is a new one as of last week, we test uh, Active Directory using a Samba Active Directory server. Uh, we test a database server client test, so make sure Postgres is working. We check Cockpit pretty extensively. Um, not on here, but we also have some tests for Podman. So we, we're testing a lot of stuff, and all of this is being tested on every single nightly compose of Rawhide branched, yeah. Uh, so, you know, this is partly just for validation, so we don't have to do so much work for validation, but also it means we know whether this stuff is broken way earlier in the cycle. Like, all the time now we know what's broken, rather than in the past we would get to, you know, two months before release and we'd start testing and we'd find everything that was broken. 
do, 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 do. Some of these tests, uh, like adding the silver blue tests, uh, CoreOS, which we test, and a lot of the server tests were kind of driven by the SIGs. So the server SIG has been very good at working with us and saying, hey, this is what we want to have tested. So we're like, okay, great, we can, that's valuable to test, so we'll add tests for that. So there's that kind of process going on. Um, so that was Compose's. What do we test for updates? For updates, we don't test all of that stuff, frankly, just because we don't have the resources. So we do a t subset, but it's a fairly big subset. Um, for So recently it got more complicated because I kind of enhanced things so that it now tries to run only relevant tests for each update. So before we had this problem where there'd be a KDE update and it would run all the GNOME tests, which was kind of dumb because a KDE update isn't going to break GNOME. So I've kind of tweaked, tweaked things around and now critical path is defined in groups and it, everything along the path knows which groups an update is critical path for. So OpenQA can say, hey, this is only in the critical path GNOME group, I'll only schedule the GNOME tests. But assuming an update was in all of the critical path groups, uh, you would get about 60 something tests. And it tests KDE, tests workstation, tests server, not running every single test we run on Compose, but running a pretty big subset of them. Um, it does the most important base tests. Um, it tests the free IPA stuff, the Samba AD stuff, cockpit database tests. It tests the, it does do an upgrade test. Uh, so it's, it's pretty wide coverage. And something that we only do in the update tests is we try and test whether the update will break the compose. Like I said on an earlier slide, this is very difficult to do manually. In automation, it's quite easy. So for every single relevant critical path update, we build a network installer image, we build a GNOME live image, a KDE live image, and we build a silver blue installer image. And then we run an install from them and then we test that it boots properly. So we know for every update, does this break the compose process basically, which is very valuable. Uh, that's one of the most important things we get out of the update tests. Uh, and yeah, just as a note, as I keep focusing on for OpenQA, the idea is we want to know, does this update break Fedora? Does it break something important? So it's not so much that we're testing Postgres because we're really interested in databases. It's because database functionality is part of the server release criteria. So it's something that is meant to always work in Fedora server. Therefore, we test that it always works. And it's the tests aren't meant to tell you, is this update to package X a good or bad version of X? It's more, does this version of X break the things that are important to us in Fedora? That's the idea. Um, the main limitation on how many tests we run is just capacity. If I had more OpenQA machines, we could run these tests on every update, but I don't, so we can't. And yeah, just to give some of those numbers, as I mentioned earlier, like we're, it's, it's getting pretty big, this thing that started out as a tiny little Skunk Works project under a desk. So we have two instances now. We have a prod and a staging instance. Um, across the two, we have over 100 simultaneous test executions. And we've run over 3 million tests since 2015. So that, that's kind of a lot. Um, discovered hundreds of bugs. I tried to get a precise number, but it's hard because often we report the bug upstream. Sometimes I just fix the bug and never file an issue. But there's at least 358 bugs tagged in Bugzilla as having been found by OpenQA. And there's a lot more in upstream trackers and things like that. So that's, that's, that's a lot of bugs. Um, on a typical day, we'll test you know, one or two composers, depending on whether branched exists. We'll test three core OS and cloud composers, and we'll test about 20 updates. So, you know, that's, that's thousands of tests a day for sure. Um, I should have updated the third bullet point. This is recent as of DevConf a couple of months ago, but just some recent things that it found at that time. Uh, we had a change go into Fedora 39 to make the, um, the EFI system partition bigger, which broke a surprising amount of things, and OpenQA found most of them, and we were able to fix those. Uh, there was an update that made Firefox crash on startup, so we caught that, and that didn't ship to users and give them a broken Firefox. Uh, the Arabic translation just disappeared from the installer one day, so we caught that. Uh, yeah, that was a fun one. Uh, GNOME was notifying of updates when running live, which is something it's not supposed to do. When you're running live, we don't want you to try and install updates because it'll try and install them to memory and the whole thing will hang. So it's specifically not supposed to do that and we caught that and fixed it. So, you know, it's catching real issues all the time that are getting fixed. And an example of something that we caught with update testing was that a new util Linux um, update um, mounted the group partition read-only, which, you know, not on Silverblue, on RPM installs, which obviously breaks everything. And because of the update testing, we were able to make sure that never actually landed in Rawhide and nobody got that update and got a broken pack system. So that was pretty cool. 
Uh, OpenQA resources, yeah. So I've mentioned this kind of in passing, but the idea with OpenQA is it's a full service system. Like, as I said, you don't really need to go and look at the OpenQA web UI. When something fails in OpenQA, one of us, the QA team, will investigate it, try and figure out why it failed. If it was just a blip, we restart the test. If it's a real bug, we'll kind of investigate it and file you know, a report in a format that's useful for you as a package maintainer, whether that's to Bugzilla or upstream. We'll, and we'll try and provide you know, the useful information on why it's failing. So you don't have to go and do that debugging work yourself. But that's, that's kind of the idea of how it's meant to work. And we develop the tests, we run the system. So we're kind of trying to provide an end-to-end -end service there. If you need to contact QA about this, we have a mailing list. Uh, we are on dis Fedora discussion as well, you know, the new forum thing. And on Fedora chat, there is a Fedora QA room where you can find us. Um, the other things are just kind of references if you download the slide deck, but the upstream site for OpenQA, and there's a downstream, there's a wiki page where I kind of explain the whole setup, and if you want to get involved with it, you can. I added the last bullet point after DevConf because um, Steph Walter had a really good talk there about open source services, the idea that you know you should be able to inspect and change services as much as you can open source code. And OpenQA does try to be like that. Everything involved in the deployment of it is open. So if you are interested, you can kind of dive in from the wiki page and you can, you, you can look at and contribute to any part of this system. Moving on to Fedora CI, um, these, this slide, all the CI slides were contributed by um, Miroslav Vagkerti, who is one of the sort of leads on Fedora CI and testing farm, so thanks a lot to him. At DevConf, he co-presented and did these slides way better than I can, so you can watch the recording of that if you want to see what he has to say, but for Fedora CI, as I mentioned, it's not an end-to-end -end service which is testing whether Fedora is broken, it's a system you can use to kind of improve your testing of your package. Um, so there's a doc site which kind of gives you a quick start in how to get, how to onboard yourself to this system. Um, it run, the tests it runs are defined in package repositories, so you keep the test in diskit alongside your package with a little bit of configuration that tells the system how and when to run them. And they're expected to be maintained by the packages, they're not maintained by the team behind Fedora CI, that's not how that works. Um, and it's meant for component level testing. Fedora CI isn't really targeted at the kind of high level integration testing that we're doing with OpenQA. It's more at the lower component level of testing. Uh, there's two formats you can write tests in, but you should use TMT, STI is going away. And yeah, you can link to the quick start guide there. There isn't a workshop tomorrow, that was also DevConf. I should have fixed that, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> there are a few generic tests that Fedora CI runs, which are kind of a hangover from AutoQA slash Taskatron. Um, which are tests that get run on every single package. Um, and that's RPM Inspect, which David Cantrell, who maintains that, is around. Uh, RPM Deplint, which tries to check for broken dependencies. And Installability, which just tests whether the package can be installed. Um, and they run in CI just because it's a sensible place to run them. Uh, do, 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 do. So, yeah. Uh, triggers. So this is kind of when you can run tests and when it, where you can get results. So Fedora CI can run on pull requests. So if you actually do pull requests for your package, which some packages do, some don't, but you, if you use pull requests, you can have test runs. So um, when a test run or pull request is created, there will be a, pa a scratch build run. I think it's running Copa. I'm not sure. Um, and CI will test that. So. You know, it doesn't ever have to touch Go Koji, and you can get the results back on the pull request page, which is kind of a good workflow if you're committed to using pull requests for your package. But it also, it tests whenever a package is built in Koji. If there are tests designed, defined for that package, it'll run them. And then the results will be shown, uh, if you create an update from that package build, you'll see the results on the Bodhi page. So that's another place where they get hooked in. Um, and yeah, under the hood stuff isn't so important, but, um, Testing farm is kind of the back end. Um, it's the kind of combined back end for all of the Fedora CI, but also CentOS Stream CI uses testing farm. Some of RHEL's testing runs in a testing farm instance. So that's part of the project of trying to unify things. Uh, yeah, same experience with RHEL CI, CentOS Stream CI, and Packet, which is a cool thing if you haven't heard of it. If you buy into Packet, if you're a maintainer upstream of the thing you're packaging in Fedora, you can kind of 
do everything in the upstream, upstream repo. You can have your spec file defined there, and then all of the downstream stuff is kind of done for you by the system. You don't have to do all of that stuff. You will get pull requests for the package when you tag a new version upstream, and tests will run on that, and you can just say, yeah, this looks good, and then the build will happen, and an update will happen. It's a really cool system if, you're, if you control the full stack, as it were. Uh, oh yeah, hardware requirements in TMT. That's just um, if your test needs some kind of specific hardware, you can now define that. There are a few things that I kind of see as testing systems, like Fedora CI and OpenQA are the main ones, but some of these things um, kind of feed in as well. So Cache is, it's a system that tests any time a package's dependencies change, it will kind of do a test build of it and see if it works, which is you know a tool for developers, but effectively it's quality testing as well, so I see that as kind of a quality system. Uh, Fedora release auto test. Uh, Lily is not here, but she's around. She's a member of our team who we're meeting for the first time here. And she wrote this thing, um, which is really cool. We have this problem with some of the requirement, the tests that are required are use very weird hardware, uh, like high-end enterprise storage stuff that we just don't have lying around in our houses or in the Fedora test system. So Fedora release auto test um, runs those tests in Red Hat's test farm called Beaker, which has access to, oh, Lily is that? Sorry, I didn't see you at the back there. Good job, Lily. Uh, which has access to a lot of really exotic hardware that we don't have anywhere else. So she, it used to be a nightmare. We would have to find someone to run those tests manually. So now those all get run automatically by that system, which is great. It saves a huge amount of pain every cycle. Uh, this stupid tool I have called RELVAL, which is related to creating the validation events as just because it was a sensible place to put it, actually runs the size checks. So if an image is oversized, RELVAL is a thing that finds out it's oversized and files a bug on it. Uh, Fedora Core OS, because of the history of where Core OS came from, has its own CI system, which is kind of cool and does a lot of testing on Fedora Core OS, and they have their whole separate release workflow. So that's another automated testing system that's out there. Uh, I mentioned Packet, and Zoolbase CI is kind of part of Fedora CI and the testing farm backend, but that is if you have a project hosted on um, you know, pagger.io, you can get testing for that run via you know, testing farm and Zool and stuff. It's not very important. More guest slides. Uh, so yeah, uh, wait, why more guest slides? I must, is this a messed up version of this talk? Dang it. I'm completely ruining my joke here, never mind. Oh, how did I get past this? I just skipped over two slides. Oh well. No, I did. I talked about that. Okay, I did. I'm sorry. I've had three hours of sleep. Do, do excuse me. So yeah, we have a couple more slides from Will's talk here, which I just thought fit in really well. Uh, so this kind of ties into the bits I just talked about. So this was in 2009, remember. So uh, coming soon-ish. Uh, this is the stuff they were trying to figure out back then. So easy auto QA for packages. This was the idea of making it so you can write tests for your package, so that's what Fedora CI does, and it works now. You know, 14 years later, we got there. It's, it's pretty good. Uh, Post-ISO build hook, so this is where Will was saying, yeah, we have this huge, you know, install test plan, which he's talking about all those wiki test pages. It'd be great to be able to automate those, right? We got there, OpenQA does that. Um, and use Fedora message bus. So at the time, AutoQA was doing this crazy thing where it called watches, so it would just wake up a script every hour and see if something had changed. So obviously now we have a proper message bus and that's how all of these systems work. So yeah, we, we got all of those. And they're coming eventually someday, probably maybe Sly. They were like, hmm, how can we do multi-host testing? That seems hard. OpenQA does that. We do test HTTPD. We do test NFS installs. Functional testing for GUIs. OpenQA is great at that. That's how you script that. So we got there. Uh, world domination is still a work in progress, but we're getting there. We'll, we'll, we'll be there soon. Don't worry. <laughs> Tim, okay, quickly. <laughs> the pina coladas, I, I've drunk a few pina coladas. <laughs> There's a, yeah, the, um, the results, if you've ever noticed on the wiki, the results from OpenQA are filed under the name Coconut, because one name for this whole thing was Project Coconut, the idea being that we wouldn't have to do any testing anymore, we would just let the robots do it and we'd just sit on the beach and drink pina coladas, so yeah. <laughs> Doesn't quite work that way, but you know, it's better than it used to be. Uh, anyway, getting back to the serious topics. Um, so testing is only, this is something I'm kind of big on, testing is only one part of this whole process. It is 
useless to run a bunch of tests if nobody ever looks at the results and does anything with them. Like one of my saddest things is when you go to an upstream project and their little thing says 60% of the tests are failing and have been for the last three years. You know, it's, so it's crucial to make sure the results are going somewhere where somebody is doing something with them. Um, so, and different ways of getting results make sense to different people. As I said, the OpenQA web UI is kind of for me and Lucas to go and look at and figure out what's going wrong. We don't necessarily want packages to look at that. What makes sense for packages is to use the interfaces that they're working with, you know, um, Diskit, Bodhi, that's where you want to go and look and get your results, right? So different routes make sense to different people. Um, one really key thing I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start saying the word gating a lot, and gating just means instead of just letting this thing through and testing it and finding out if it's broken, we don't let it through unless the tests pass, um, which is a really key thing we've been discovering over time. Um, and the point, the thing we're trying to achieve with gating is to catch problems before they infect other processes and to catch them before people see them on their systems. So we don't want problems getting to where Compose is broken, you can't run package builds because another broken package got in and broke the build route, and we don't want people updating their systems and seeing bugs. So that's why gating is important. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So in practice, where do you get results? So as I mentioned, for Fedora CI, the earliest point you're really going to get your results in a way that's useful to packages is in Diskit. Um, so if you're using pull requests, you can get the results of tests in there. And this is a fairly old screenshot, and it's a little zoomed in, a uh, little scroll, you know, squished down, but you can kind of see it. So this is a pull request for a package, and then down at the bottom, you've got like three little green blobs, and those are results from Fedora CI saying, okay, this is this one passed its test, this one's fine. So that's one level. The benefit of this level is it's the earliest possible point. Um, so if you're testing at this level, this is before anything gets even into Koji. And um, if you're using pull requests for everything, this is great because you know exactly this pull request broke it. You, can, you have a very tight development loop if you're testing at this point, right? Uh, the drawback is that you do have to use pull requests, which a lot of packages are not used to doing. If you're the only person working on a package, it's kind of weird to go and create pull requests and look at the web interface. You just kind of want to fed package commit, fed package push, fed package build. And if you have cases where packages depend upon each other, um, so you need to update two packages at once, and if either, either of them won't work without the other, then you, it's kind of difficult at this level to, to do that. So the other major integration point we have is Bodhi, uh, which is the update system. So this is integration at the update level. Uh, so the, advan the key advantage is just the thing I was talking about, is if you have packages that are interdependent, Bodhi is where you group them together and say these packages go together, and if we test at that level, we can test you know, the, the group of packages that should work together and see if they do work together. Um, and it's also, you know, just by default for packages who don't use pull requests, this is where you're probably going to see your test results. Um, so yeah, it displays the results from OpenQA and Fedora CI. Uh, fairly recently, it's been updated to also show when tests are queued or running. Like before, um, before a test actually completed, Bodhi would just tell you the result was missing, which was a bit confusing and scary. And that was just because the system hadn't got to it yet. But now it does actually tell you it's, it's in the queue or it's currently running. Um, yeah, uh, fewer but we had some issues with this in the past and I've kind of been working on it to try and make it as consistent, as accurate as possible. There are still a few things that we know are problems. Like for instance, it will let you try and waive the result if a test is running, but that doesn't work. So you can click the wave button all day long and it'll file a waiver, but the, the actual system that decides whether the update can go or not doesn't account for waivers on a running test, so that's something we want to improve. But we're, gen we're basically trying to make this as accurate and you know, consistent as we possibly can. Um, the, bold, the in bold is there because it's kind of a big deal. As of since the last time I gave this talk, all updates for all releases are now gated, including Rawhide. So for the first time in basically Fedora history, when you do a build for Rawhide, it does not go straight into Rawhide. It now waits for the OpenQA test to complete, and if any of the critical ones fail, your update does not go into Rawhide. So this is, this is one of the biggest things we've done for a while, so I'm kind of proud of it and also scared of it, but 
that's happening and nobody's killed me yet, so I guess it's going all right. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that, that just means nothing gets in unless it's passing the tests, basically, which is pretty huge. Um, on a package-by-package package level, you can actually configure the gating requirements. So for the OpenQA tests, they're all kind of the same. But if you put tests for your package in CI, you can also add a file in the repository which says gate on those tests, and then your update won't go through unless those tests pass as well. Uh, as I said, there's a button for waiving a bogus a failure. So if you're sure, if you're really, really sure that a failure doesn't actually mean things are broken, you can waive it. I would like for people to be very sparing with the use of that button. Because the problem if an update that has failures goes through is that then possibly all subsequent updates may have the same failure, which is going to be an issue. So, but it is there if we need to use it. Um, and yeah, the way Bodhi works is it listens out for messages, um, you know, Fedora messages from results DB and sort of updates its situation. Um, a couple of things that we know about this at the moment, um, if you've noticed problems with Fedora CI test results like being wrong or just not showing up, Fedora CI is having issues with DNF5 and Python 3.12, which are kind of affecting the test running. So that's why the CI folks are working on that really hard, but just because of the details of that system, it's quite difficult to fix all of that. And some OpenQA tests recently have been affected by this annoying problem that Kevin knows all about where we're getting a 404 from a repository which is making the test fail. I'm hoping something I did this morning will kind of make that less of a problem, but if you've had an update held up for a few hours, that was probably why, and we're sorry about that. As a packager, if you see failures in Bodhi, what should you do? This is a question people ask me, so I wanted to explain it to you. Um, if the test failure is for a Fedora CI test that's not one of those generic CI tests, then that's kind of on you, because as we said, Fedora CI is something for you to use. So you should kind of debug your own failures for Fedora CI fails. Um, when you click on a failure, it should take you to the logs. Um, it takes you to Jenkins' page, I think, and from there you can get to the testing farm page with more details. Um, if it's one of those Fedora CI generic failures, um, check the logs from the failure and see if it actually seems to be caused by your update, in which case you should fix it, obviously. If not, talk to the CI team and see if there's a problem with the system. And that's got some links to where you can do that. For OpenQA, in general, you don't have to do anything. If you're impatient, you can go and look at OpenQA and try and debug it yourself. But what we aim for is that within 24 hours, one of us will investigate it and either fix it or tell you what the problem is in a Bodhi comment, a bug report, an issue report, something like that. If that doesn't happen, or if you really need to figure it out right, right now, you can contact us via you know, Fedora chat, or via our mailing list, or any of the other ways you can get in touch with us, and we will try and help. Um, there is also a button in Bodhi to rerun tests. When you click that, it sends out a message that both CI and OpenQA listen to, and just re-trigger all the tests for the update. Um, if there's a failure that you're not sure whether it's genuine, you can click that button and have all the tests rerun which is much safer than waiving the result, and only waive the result if you're really sure it's, it's okay to do so. And, and for problems with Bodhi itself, you can contact the CPE team um, in the Fedora Applications channel, or you can contact QA, but we'll probably just go and ask Kevin to fix it, so, you yeah. uh, <laughs> know. Yeah. And one more integration point, the Fedora Wiki. We still have those giant wiki pages full of results. And the reason we use it is simply because we need a, we still have some of the tests are still manual. So we need a place where all the manual and automated results kind of go together. And when we're doing the meeting that decides whether we release Fedora, we just want to have something we can look at and see all of the results. So sadly, the wiki is still apparently the best way to do that. So there is a dumb system I wrote which actually reports the results from OpenQA into the wiki automatically, and then humans file their own results into the wiki, and then we look at it and we can see all the results together. Um, RELVAL size check results also go in that way. Uh, do, 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 do. So behind the scenes, this stuff, so uh, we got, what do we got, 15 minutes left? So we can go into this a bit. This bit of the talk is a little bit optional, but here it is. Um, behind the scenes, there's a lot going on to make all of this work together. Um, it's, it's quite complicated, I think, because a lot of this stuff came out of an idea we had 10 years ago called Factory 2.0, when at the time, the, the buzz concept was microservices. 
So I don't know if anyone remembers a few flocks back, but we had these giant whiteboards, uh, which Ralph Bean would stand in front of with all these little boxes about how Fedora was going to get built, and this bit would talk to this bit, and this bit, did, 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 did. and so about half of that got done. And because those bits are still around, we still use them, so there's kind of a lot of complication in how all these things talk to each other. Uh, but we have a mess. The most important thing is Fedora messaging, which is a message bus. So. The way CI and OpenQA know how to kick off tests is that they listen out for messages from Koji um, or from Diskit for pull requests that say, hey, you know, a new package build happened or an update is ready for testing. So they listen for the message and then they test the thing. Um, and then they also communicate back via messages. So both OpenQA and Fedora CI publish messages when they've completed a test. Results DB is where we keep the results. So both Fedora CI and OpenQA file their results in Results DB, which is kind of part of Taskatron, so Taskatron is still with us. Um, WaverDB is where the waivers live, which is just a really simple, you know, it's a, it's a database of waivers with a JSON interface, it's very simple. GreenWave is the thing that um, it decides, when we talk about gating, uh, the way gating actually works is that Bodhi sort of asks GreenWave whether this package is okay, basically. Uh, and, it, and all GreenWave does is look at the results, look at the waivers from results DB and waivers DB and say yes or no. It's, you know, it's, if we were writing this from scratch today, we'd probably just dump it all in Bodhi because the idea was lots of different things would use GreenWave, but as it turns out, the only thing that uses GreenWave is Bodhi. But this is how it got written. We, had a, we have a lot of different pieces. Um, do, do, do. Yeah, so that's kind of how it all, and one, I guess an interesting thing about that is that Fedora CI and OpenQA look like very different systems, but there is a lot of kind of integration going on, and we have this concept that at the point where you're looking at the results in Bodhi, it doesn't matter that much which system they ran in, because everything is kind of integrated in terms of where the results go and how the gating works, so which system the test ran in is kind of just a detail. So that's, that's kind of how we looked at integrating those systems. This was the most popular slide like, that I added in the second version of this talk. If you would like to say you were in this talk, but it's been very boring and you've just been looking at cat pictures for the last 40 minutes. Um, just look at this slide and you can say you were here. Uh, this, is, this is the entire talk in one slide. So OpenQA tests updates and composes. Fedora CI tests package builds. Um, we test composes. We use, we use those manually. Updates get tested through Bodhi and we do gate those. And uh, yeah, that's the whole thing. <laughs> So yeah, you can download, I, the slide deck is on Shed, so you can grab the slide deck if you want to see all of these, and it has my notes on it, which have some good stuff on it. Uh, something quick? Or were you? Yeah, over there. And just a question that uh, popped up in my mind. I received a Bugzilla report uh, a few days ago. Um, one of my packages was causing a conflict um, uh, executable uh, by the same name. Um, would that be caught by uh, QA uh, gating uh, these days, or? No, so that's not something we explicitly test for. So it's something that could potentially go into CI, I guess, as a generic test, but we don't have one right now. And I say with OpenQA, it's very focused on kind of functional testing, you know, is Fedora broken? So we would catch something like that if it caused something else to break. So for instance, we'll catch dependency problems if they make one of the things we're testing fail. But we won't just catch any dependency problem in any package in your update because it might not affect the test. So the same thing there is like if that conflict actually caused, you know, the free IPA test to fail, then we would catch it. But we can't say we would catch all of those issues at this point in time, no. Would it be uh, Koshai uh, eventually catching it? As yeah, possibly Koshai. That's the kind of thing Koshai could be extended to. Sounds like a good test. Yeah. yeah. Or as I say, it could be a generic test in Fedora CI. Um, yeah, RPM inspect. Yeah, RPM inspect, but like you're saying, those generic kind of yeah, things the things that we run. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's, that would probably be something that would go into the Fedora CI workflow right. somewhere. I just uh, that was my question, and I have an anecdotal uh, fact. You just mentioned an old uh, FUTCON, uh, 2009. Yeah. Apparently, we had two this year. Because if I turn around, the, I was talking about the Toronto one. Yeah. Yeah, I'm having the the other one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Something's with me. Uh, so we, we, you mentioned RPM inspect, and yep. I was just looking at uh, the last eight updates that I made, and they all fail because RPM inspect is very 
um, mm, mm, inflexible. And yep. it lectures me that I should talk to uh, product uh, security at Red Hat to allow a code point in my test file. <laughs> uh, and the, the use of a function in my test file, I should rethink how I program. And the third message was something else. Yeah. Uh, like, I don't know, I would love to have systemd installation tested by RPM inspect, but it doesn't happen because it, it just refuses to okay. install systemd. Uh, yeah. How can we get, like, manageable opt-outs and opt-ins of tests? That's a good question. Um, so David Cantrell actually is here and did a t he's the maintainer of RPM Inspect. He's here, he did a talk on RPM Inspect this morning, so he would be a great person to answer those. I know he's trying to make it as configurable as possible. Um, from the perspective of this talk, RPM Inspect is not a gating test unless you, your package decides to make it one, so nothing will ever be gated on RPM Inspect unless you say that in a gating YAML file. What I, I was looking at the same stuff during David's talk, just out of interest. And one thing I noticed is that RPM Inspect has like a good, war, good inspect or bad. So a lot of the things are inspect, which is kind of between a pass and a fail. But any time we get anything but all goods, the, the RPM Inspect result is reported as a failure. So that's kind of one thing we could maybe improve on. And the other thing, yeah, I, I know that he will take feature requests for, you know, being able to configure to say this, to exclude you know, this warning for your package and say, I think this is fine. Uh, so you can get that into RPM Inspect at some level, but he could give you a much more detailed answer for that part of it. You can uh, add RPM lint uh, RC to, to this yeah, thing, which I believe that's kind say of how it works. ignore these kind of errors. There, there, there's supposed to be some way you can just basically exclude specific Failures, but I don't know the details of it. But there if is if you put foo dot it. spec uh, yeah. dot rpm lint rc yeah. uh, and in the writer repo? config, which which uh, okay. error should be ignored, waived, uh, then then yeah. it will be ignored. Yeah. But I guess another thing, if if rpm inspect doesn't run the installability test, if the static test fails, I guess that could just be changed, and it could run both tests always. Uh, but I guess David might have a reason not to do that. I'm not sure. In OpenQA, we, we run all the tests. We don't stop if one test fails. Sorry, I just want to get through my last slides before we do more questions. Uh, the future. Um, so this, it's kind of funny to think about, is this a lot of testing? Because to me, it feels like a lot of testing. But you can also look at it as not really enough testing. Because an operating system is huge. There is so much stuff we could test that we're not testing. It's, a, it's an infinite ocean, and we're just trying to make the drop bigger, right? But we can always try and make the drop a bit bigger. We do, yeah, yeah. Um, so our limitations, as, again, as I said, is just both the capacity to run tests, like OpenQA has a certain amount of hardware, and I can't run too many tests or it just gets backed up, um, but also the capacity to analyze and act on the results. As I said, a test system which is just spewing out failures that no one has time to look at is a useless test system. So we also need people to, I try and keep OpenQA down to the level where we can inspect every important failure and do useful things about it. Um, and I'd say we've come a long way. We're not at the point where we're doing CI for an operating system yet, which is very difficult, but we can keep trying to get more. For OpenQA, we want to, we, we keep writing tests, especially Lucas is always writing more tests, so we're going to test more applications. I want to do more Podman testing. The Podman team is keen on that. We want to test flat packs, because there was a case a few weeks ago where flat pack install just stopped working. We weren't testing it, so we want to test it so we can catch that. Uh, we've got validation requirements for toolbox, which need to get automated. So we have a whole pipeline of new tests to write. Um, I'm always working on trying to make the Rawhide gating thing as smooth as possible. So that's a future plan. Uh, more architectures would be nice. Uh, we have ARCH64 right now, but it's very hardware constrained. So we don't run the update tests on ARCH64 because we don't have enough hardware. It would be great to have S390. We do PPC on staging, but not prod again because there isn't enough hardware. Uh, we got a cool plan to do bare metal testing in OpenQA using a thing called PyKVM, which is a little Raspberry Pi based box, which would basically let us treat a real system. It can inject, you know, mouse movements and stuff into a real system the way OpenQA does with a virtual machine. So we should be able to kind of run our tests on real hardware using that, which would be cool. And Lucas has been working on that too. And more tailored update tests is just kind of like, since we now have this mechanism for running different tests on different updates, we could maybe run the entire install suite for an Anaconda test, Anaconda update, for instance. It would be nice to do that. And possibly move it to the cloud, which I've been looking at for years, but maybe it'll happen. 
But RCI plans, uh, this again is Miro's slide, so I don't know what all of these are, but multi-host testing is kind of that thing where you have different tests talking to each other. Um, more kind of back-end improvements, finally get rid of STI, and testing farm reservations is like again, reserving specific hardware and just kind of improving their, their error rate and stuff, so. Yep. Oh, and another thing I want to work on is there are things that aren't packages that change and break stuff. So you can make a change to the kickstarts and break the compose. And right now we won't catch that because we don't run a test when you change the kickstarts. So I would like to write all the integration bits so that when someone has a pull request to the kickstarts, we will run the open QA tests and find out if it breaks. But it's just, it's a lot of stuff to work. Same thing for comps. Uh, Pungy Fedora is the repo where the compose configuration goes. And again, if you change that and get it wrong, you break the compose. And workstation OS tree config is misleadingly named. It's where all of the OS tree you know, definitions go. So not just Silverblue, but also Kinoit, Sericia, all of those. And again, they have sort of configuration, which if you change it, you break the compose. And we don't test any of that. So I would love to be able to test all of those things if we could. And yeah, so thanks to Miroslav again for the CI slides. Uh, thanks to Mo Duffy who made the template I used here. Uh, and if anyone has any more questions, I think we have like three minutes. Yes. Uh, not a question, but a comment. Yep. Uh, the coming or the goals, uh, TMT now has uh, multi-host testing. Yay. Yes. And uh, there's reservations in testing form. Yay. So yeah, I should have got Miro to update this slide again. It's, it's kind of fun. It's very recent. Th yeah, that's yeah. like in the last month. So It's kind of fun because I've done this talk four times. And every time, like, I've had to revise things. It's like, if you go back to the first version of it, it's like, we weren't doing rawhide gating. We were, like, CI was totally different. It's kind of fun how fast things are changing. <laughs> yeah. Any more? Oh, three more. I don't know whose hand went up first. Amita. Uh, what do you mean by moving to the cloud? Is it the testing moving to the cloud? Yeah. Or OpenQA moving to the cloud? Or you want to test the cloud as well? I see what you mean. Yeah, no, we're running the test system in the cloud, running OpenQA itself in the cloud. We do do some testing of the cloud in OpenQA already. We test cloud images. Um, but yeah, so as I keep saying, our constraints are resources. Like we have literal hardware systems in the Fedora data center running the OpenQA tests, and it's quite difficult to get more of them, get them racked, get the networking set up. If we could move it to the cloud, you know, we can scale up and down as much as we have money for, as much as Amazon will give to us, right? But so there is actually a project going on with some folks from Amazon and Meta to get an intern, I think a Meta intern, who will look at doing this. Because it's kind of, it's a several week project and I never have several, me and Lucas, we never have several weeks to set aside to look at this. So it would be really cool if a person can kind of do it and lay the groundwork at least for us to, to do that. Because that would let us scale much further. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, just a real quick one. Uh, I was reminded by the RPM inspect uh, stuff. Uh, Fedora Q, uh, Fedora CI, one of the tests that it does is install all the sub packages to right. make sure they're installable. Yeah. That fails every time on Fedora release, the Fedora release package, because they, they it has all the variants and they conflict yeah. with each other. So there may be, if there's some way we could fix that, that would actually be great. But I looked at it and I couldn't see how to, like, exclude that so yeah again I, I think it would be really good to talk to David about it because he is very open to like this is a problem how can we fix this problem kind of feedback so I think and he would definitely be the guy for that yeah do we have time to take Spignavs quickly or I don't think we have another session so, uh, so. I was thinking about because I have the same problem in systemd and then basically there should be a way to say try those groups and uh, uh, OpenQA you had this slide where the the, the list of screenshots goes to from green to red and yeah, back to yeah, green. Yeah, yeah, let me get back there. What does it mean that it's green at the end? Uh, let me get back to the screenshot. There's a lot of slides in this talk, my word. I just kept adding those mothers. Um, no, la oh, yeah, okay. So that is a thing in OpenQA called the post-fail hook. Uh, so when a test fails, because we want to get information out to know why it failed. So after the test fails, it runs like a, sp these things down the left are all the test, like graphical weight login there, or all the kind of test modules that make up a test. When a test fails, it jumps to a special one called the post fail hook, which just, what you use it for is like grab, a stat grab the journal and upload that, grab a bunch of log files and upload those. We have special ones, like if it goes to the emergency boot prompt, 
it recognizes that, and instead of trying to get things out the normal way, it gets them out on the serial console, you know, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that's why. So that green one at the end is actually just uh, the post fail hook, like succeeding with something. So when you, if you are working from the web UI, when you get a failure, you generally want to look for the last red square, and that's where the test actually failed. And anything that happened after that was just, you know, post failure informational stuff. Anybody else? Nope. All right. Thanks a lot for coming out, guys.